Ah, that cool, crisp air, the turning leaves, the abolishment of the four month long triple digit heat wave. <sighs> you know what time of year it is. Artober, baby! Where we celebrate everything big, mean, and green. Grab your chopper and load your daka, cause the reason of the season is. Whoa! But how should we celebrate? Lord knows you still have hundreds of points worth of orcs to build paint. True, but I'm stepping it up with something even better. So y'all remember Gear Guts Mech Shop? They're a sci-fi orc specialist who creates models for your favorite tabletop game that, in my opinion, are even more impressive than the official thing. With specializations in huge hulking, stomping, shooting, chopping bots. Ah, there's the honesty. But more than that, I've always loved Gear Guts' bigger, badder, bruiser boys. And together with the season of Orktober, we made something special. Not just the reincarnation of my OC war boss Orca Nobudaka, but an entire line of Bushi Bruisers, wholly unique and culturally inspired. I never thought I'd be able to bring these two personal loves together in this way, but Gork bless you, Gear Guts! I'm still losing my mind the fact that I've been able to bring this to life. Wait, so what's your input in all this? Well, I actually never asked the guy, but after working on Nobudaka's reincarnation, I suppose Gear Guts got the itch to build up even more Bushi Bruisers, because he asked me for some cultural ideas, and he sent me back stuff like this, and this, and this, and this, taking all the samurai-oriented cultural and historical notes that I gave, and created a brand new tribe. Yes, I want you to check these guys out if you play tabletop. Yes, I want you to use the link in the description to see them all for yourself. But more than anything, I want to talk about where all of these designs come from, because they're not as obvious as you might think. In fact, for me personally, what started as a spark from the Orca Nobudaka slash Oda Nobunaga video I did a month back has turned into a raging inferno of realization. Samurai are one of, if not the best historical and cultural warrior classes of the world to take influence from when creating an orc tribe. The cannibalistic, verbally abusive, flatulent, muscle-bound morons who make their weapons and vehicles out of sheet metal, rusted bolts, and literal hopes and dreams have the best cultural relation with a samurai? Yeah, I know that sounds stupid, but consider their life philosophy for example. What are orcs? They are, by design, living weapons whose only purpose is dealing with life and death, to fight and die. Never squandering their existence, but never fearing death because they just want to go out in style, so to speak. And it's a deep-rooted hope for all greenskins. Every orc is literally born into the role of a warrior as they transition from a wild boy youth to a proper boy. They do not consider their own mortality over doing what they know and are meant to do. Fight, win, or die in a blaze of glory. And they wouldn't have it any other way. So, what about samurai? Well, children of samurai families were given Boken to become familiar with combat at the ripe young age of three. Then given a real sword between the ages of five and seven, then becoming a full-fledged warrior at 13, literally born into the warrior mindset. A samurai's existence is to deal with life and death, whether it be for their lord, their house, or their government. And while a samurai can be very introspective about their existence and mortality, they never fear death as to die fighting in battle is the greatest end that they could meet. They never squander their life, but never once shied away from a glorious death. Sound familiar? Heck, when it even comes to their history and sense of duty, these two are the same. Even though orcs fight for fun, they do have an ingrained subconscious sense of duty. They were engineered by the Old Ones and Brain Boys to specifically fight against and drive out the Necrons. Samurai, similarly, were originally founded as a military force by the Heian period court to drive out the Emishi people in the Tohoku region. But what happened when both of these two warrior groups lost centralized power that they fought for? They immediately fell in a civil war! After the War in Heaven and the War of the Beasts, when the orcs were at their most fractured and decentralized in their existence, they immediately turned into infighting, with dozens of newly emerging warlords gathering power in the galaxy to create their own brutal empires and territory. With no centralized enemy to fight, they immediately turned on each other. This is exactly what happened with the samurai in multiple points of world history. After the Emishi people were subdued, samurai began to immediately infight for power culminating into country-sized wars not once, but three freaking times. First in the form of the Genpei War in the 1180s, then again during the Onin War of the 1460s leading into 200 years of the Sengoku Jidai where the entire country was split into dozens of micro-territories ruled over by individual warlords who wanted to control the entire known land. Gee, don't that sound familiar? And then finally during the Boshin War of 1868, with samurai and military personnel on both sides either fighting for the Emperor or the Shogun. Huh. 
I guess for all the pump we give Samurai, historically they were actually one of the world's most prone to infighting warrior class. But the question now becomes, how did Gear Guts take my cultural notes and apply them to his bruisers? Because for me personally, what I found to be the absolute coolest aspect of his bushy bruisers was how he applied the dozens of cultural aspects of Samurai that I gave to him and then 100% subverted them. Like, let's have a look at the standard Bruiser Shock Troopers, for example. Seems pretty straightforward, right? Like, the armor itself is this sick combination of Oyoroi Heian period armor with its more boxy skirt of plates compared to the 1500 segmented plate skirt of the Dolmaru, but the majority of this armor is absolutely Kiritsuke Kozane Do. A sort of full Kozane Do armor made up of several rows of armor plating lashed together rather than the more exquisite scaled armor of the more expensive Dolmaru. And that absolutely checks out as orcs forge their armor by welding and hammering scraps of metal together. Thus, it would make more sense for the Bushi Bruiser armor to be more slapdash laminar armor rather than intricately laced lamellar scale mail armor. But this is where things get subversive. Have a look at the Kabuto helms of the Bushi Bruisers. Notice anything missing? Do two things missing! They don't have Mempo Mass or Datemono Crests! Exactly. Now, can you guess why? Uh, they forgot them? Oh, no, 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 no. See, the Bushi Bruisers know why Samurai Armor had these. The Datemono Crest made a Samurai look a lot more decorative, and the Mempo Mask made them look a lot more fearsome. The thing is, the Bushi Bruisers don't want them. They know full and well that their giant jaws and jagged teeth are more than enough to scare away any Yumi gets, so they actively cover them up in order to keep those pansies from running off like scare grots from a fight. As for the Date Mono Crest, unless they're a bad moon, no orc would want that much flash, so they opt out of having any sort of useless decor on their bonds. This is what I mean. It's not that the Bushi Bruisers are just adopting samurai culture, but they're taking it into account like a real orc would. But it doesn't stop there. Let's have a look at their weapons, many of which have various kinds of katana at their side, which is pretty self-explanatory. Samurai always had their swords, orcs always got their chapas. But a fine little detail that I noticed comes from their explosives. Most of the time, orcs will carry around stick bombs as their choice of grenade. But Bushi boys are carrying around historically accurate Japanese Horokuhiya bombs. These were explosives whose outer shell was made of a clay and then wrapped in a rope to hold the whole charge together. And inside would be carefully laid out structures of gunpowder and shrapnel. With the origin of their name coming from the Horoku earthenware that early samurai would originally use as the bomb's casing. Again, considering orcs scavenge scrap for any and all of their weapons, for Bushi bruisers to use scrapped earthenware as grenade castings it makes a lot of sense. And another curious thing that I found with the Shock Troopers was their Sluggas, most of which have pretty straightforward Tanzutsu matchlock pistols, which were more of a samurai status symbol to use on horseback for personal defense. However, one of these boys has their Tanzutsu built into their cybernetic arm. Why is this important? Because not only is this cool as hell, it's also historically accurate. Okay, not completely, but the thing about the Tanzutsu pistol is that many of them were in fact so small that a samurai in casual wear could actually slip one of these guns into their kimono sleeves without suspicion. Japan's conceal and carry, if you will. So the fact that this Bushi Bruiser has one built into his sleeve, possibly retractable, in its own orky way is completely accurate. Not to mention it looks like a freaking double-barreled shotgun more than anything. And something that's kind of unique to Japan is that so many of their big caliber guns, like the Ozutsu, could actually be pretty small and stout. Something that an orc could easily attach to their arm without much of a weight problem. Then we come to the Bruiser Assault Gunners, and this also seems pretty standard, right? All these boys carrying around scrapped together flintlocks made of metal tubes and primitive wooden stocks. But check this out. Look how freaking long these bayonets are. Compared to a Lasgun Bayonet, for example, they've got some freaking length on them. Well, believe it or not, and whether on accident or on purpose, this is also a historical reference. When Japanese military started using bayonets, they were the same 16-inch blades that most of the West were using. However, come World War I and II, while much of the Western world dropped their bayonet length to about 10 inches or less, Japan kept theirs at 16 inches. History says that the reason comes from the fact that US soldiers were a lot taller than Japanese soldiers, thus they wanted the extra length, but extra threat range is extra threat range, and I would understand why an orc like the Bushi Bruisers would want more knife to stick a git with. Next, we got the tank hunters, and you might be wondering if traditional tank hunters were all about rocket launchers, then why don't the Bushi Bruisers have some Hia rocket arrows fired out of old Zutsu cannons? It's not like it was rare for samurai back then to have them. Instead, they're using crude bows with rockets welded onto a beam as an arrow. Well, I would argue that this is just as much, if not more, of a historical relevance than the more modern rocket launcher. You gotta understand that as soon as they had access to gunpowder, samurai and shinobi alike were experimenting with it to either make their arrows go faster or make it more daka. In reality, Japan's warrior class had multiple different rocket arrow types. 
There were some that would actually project the rocket faster and further. Then there were multiple, underline multiple styles of arrows with explosive heads, far more varied than the latter use cannon oriented RPGs. So for as silly as it might look for Bushy Bruisers to lob rockets the old fashioned way with a bow and arrow, the old fashioned way is entirely spot on historically. Then we got the odd Bushy Bruiser, and this one took a moment for me. Cause we've got an orc boy with a long sheet nailed to his cranium, and then an orc boy skeleton coming out of his back with the same sheet on his face. With one very obviously controlling the other based on their similar pose, but to this day I'm still not sure who's controlling what. But either way, this is 100% a reference to a Jiangxi, which is more Chinese, not so much Japanese. But like many cultural aspects of China, Japan's been able to integrate it into its own culture. Very long story short, Jiangxi are a vampire zombie hybrid that hop around looking for people to suck the chi out of them. Usually active at night, while during the day they either hide in caves or coffins. And they wear Qing period clothing and have a Hulu talisman on their head as a binding spell that animates them, usually done by some dark Taoist wizard using the dead as their minions. In reality though, Jiangxi are little more than rigor mortis induced cadavers that are being cheaply shipped back to their home to be buried. In old China, it was believed that people who moved from their hometown to find work would become really homesick in death, so their body needed transported back. This however was incredibly expensive, so poor folk would pay Taos priests to hang their loved ones single file on a long bamboo rod and then carry them to their respective homes. Because of this particular style of transport and how bamboo is pretty flexible, the bodies actually looked like they were hopping rather than just simply bouncing around. So going back to the odd bruiser, it's kind of hard to tell who's controlling who like I said. Either the boy or the skeleton of the boy. And both of them have that hulu on their forehead. But regardless, someone is controlling someone else. And given the fact that orc weird boys are the orc equivalent to a spellcaster, it 100% checks out. Everything from the Odd Bruiser's magic staff, to the Fulu Talisman, to the controlling of the undead 100% makes this guy a Jiangxi. Alright, now we gotta talk about the new Daka wagon for the Bushi Bruisers. And the first thing I know you're gonna notice is that this battle wagon is far more house than tank, and that's by Gear Guts' design. He told me that he wanted to capture this idea of a combination of house moving castle and mortal engines. The idea that these vehicles actually served as some sort of mobile kingdom or set of keeps in order to travel the waste as they would need to move from next destination to next destination after they've looted all the scrap in the area. He told me that, quote, I liked the idea of the samurai bruisers owning all that they could see, and it just happens that each day their view is a little bit different. Yeah, checks out with the Sengoku period samurai. Every half-decent daimyo believed it was their destiny to control every square inch of Japan that they saw. Sure, but that's just the start of the similarities. The interesting thing is that these buildings themselves are 100% Japanese homes, layered in shoji walls. Now, we think shoji walls as being refined and delicate. After all, they're really easy to tear and really expensive to replace. Wouldn't make sense for orcs to have that, right? But what most folks may not realize is that they served a more practical purpose at their inception. Shoji were valued for not only being a semi-buried to the natural world, allowing for sounds of nature to enter the domicile, but it created room-to-room -room natural illumination as light bounced off of the paper. Shoji were also amazing at diffusing air, allowing cool or warm air to circulate through the rest of the home. Now, going back to the Bushi Bruisers, we know for a fact that they have to travel from place to place in order to loot more and more scrap to survive on. Well, wouldn't the minimalist approach make the most sense for them? Why waste resources when you can just have natural illumination and airflow with a simple crisscross of paper or canvas? Would absolutely save on gas not having to power electric lights or fans. I also discovered that its roof was an actual real structural formation of bamboo called Kirizuma Yane. A gabble? Is it pronounced gabble? Anyway, triangular roof that uses natural bamboo or adopts natural bamboo structure, creating a highly efficient and natural system of draining rain and debris. Again, we got more natural efficiency. But now we come to my boy, the war boss that started it all, Orca Nobu Daka in his brand new yet younger incarnation before he latched onto his body more Daka than functioning limbs. Now if you haven't seen my preliminary video on my boy, go watch that so you can get the basics of his design under wraps because there is so much more that's been added. While still maintaining his modern cyborg body, he sports his own big chop tana, three-barreled boomstick, 
and his internal guts have been replaced with a fanged furnace. Using the heads of his enemies as fuel, as his twin smokestacks coming out of his back belch smoke above his twin Sashimono banners. Beyond just the sheer badass feel of this boy, everything I listed goes into historical influences. As most of you already know, the cyborg body represents his namesake Oda Nobunaga's obsession with modernization of military hardware and the tactics that come from it. His three-barreled boomstick, which mirrors the old three-barreled pepper guns from the 1600s, reflects Oda Nobunaga's understanding and mastery of the three-group gunline system of fire, reload, and aim, but now he's got a mod furnace in his gut that represents two things. First of all, it is a massive shout-out to Jing Tian, a Chinese warrior god that didn't stop fighting after being beheaded. Instead, he just grew a face in his stomach and kept on fighting. An orky as hell concept if I've ever heard one. Of course, I feel like this design really comes from Bishamon from Darkstalkers. Sorry, going off on a tangent here. But the other thing is that this represents the Kubi Jiken, or head viewing ceremony, where samurai would bring the heads of their defeated enemies to their generals as proof of their service and capabilities as a warrior, earning them new titles and new land. For Nobutaka, his Bushi Bruisers would bring and present the various heads of their enemies in hopes of rising up the warrior ranks and becoming knobs. But rather than preserve the head like a samurai would, Nobudaku instead tossed this symbol of his enemy in his furnace of a gut, consuming and then expelling the remnants of his enemies. Finally, while many samurai would only wear one Sashimono banner to represent the clan they fight for, Nobudaka wears two on his smokestacks because he's the big boss, and with two banners, the boys ain't gonna forget that. And this is Nobutaka in his early stages of being a war boss. There's still a bigger, meaner, more Daka lane version of him still to come. Huh. Who would have thunk that Samurai and Oryx were a match made in heaven? Well, don't get me wrong, there are some very obvious differences, mostly in terms of hygiene and social decorum. But at their warrior heart, I really do think that there was very little different between these two. And if you're wanting some bigger, meaner, Bushi-inspired boys for your army, or you just love their aesthetic, check out Gear Guts Mech Shop in the link below. He's got an Orktober special going on right now with 20% off of basic models and 40% off STLs. And the more people show interest in these, the more different boys, bots, wagons, and weapons we can make with that Bushi Bruiser style. But as always, stop back every other week for even more videos on Japan, culture, and... I'm not gonna lie, I want to do more orc videos. I know it's super unrelated to what I've been doing for the last 10 years, but damn it if I'm not having an absolute blast with these boys. So tune in next time, and until then everyone, this is Gaijin Goomba, signing out.